Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the 25th meeting of this year, the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Um, before we move to the first item, remind you all to switch off mobile phones, etc., which can interfere with the sound system. There will be committee members who may be consulting tablets uh, uh, during the meeting because they provide meeting papers. Uh, so agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private. First item today uh, is to decide whether consideration of its approach to the scrutiny of the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill at item four should be taken in private. Are we all agreed? Yeah. We are agreed. So we will move uh, at that item into private. Um, the next one is agenda item two, uh, Scotland's climate change targets. So the second item today is to take evidence from the Minister uh, on Scotland's climate change targets, which follows the evidence session with stakeholders last week. I remind members that uh, there are four committees that have been looking at the Low Carbon Scotland Meeting Our Emissions Reduction Target 2013-27, to the draft second report on proposals and policies, which is also known as RPP2. Uh, Raki is now going to take a broader view of RPP2 and the climate change targets in the light of three successive years of not meeting the immediate targets. Uh, so I welcome the Minister and uh, good morning, uh, Paul, and his officials, Jim Gilmore, Policy Advisor, Director for Energy and Climate Change, and John Ireland, Deputy Director of Low Carbon Economy uh, Division in the Scottish Government. I refer members to the paper. Uh, in front of you and ask the Minister if he wishes to make any opening remarks. If that's okay. Please yeah. do. Thank you. Thank you, Convener, and thank you, Committee. Um, momentum towards a new global climate change agreement is uh, mercifully uh, growing. At uh, the UN Climate Summit in New York in September, world leaders committed to finalise a meaningful, universal new agreement under the United Nations uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change in Paris in 2015 and to arrive at the first draft of such an agreement at the UN Climate Conference in Lima in December this year. For our part, the Scottish Government is committed to playing as full a role as possible in international effort and to achieve concerted international action to bring global emissions down to a level consistent with containing increases in global av average temperatures to 2 degrees Celsius or less. Scotland's domestic commitments are ambitious and remain an inspiration to many. While there are undoubtedly challenges that lie ahead, we can be proud of our achievements to date. Scotland is over halfway to meeting our national Scotland-wide target of a 42% reduction by 2020. Uh, latest figures indicate we remain on track to achieve a 42% or better reduction in Scotland's emissions by 2020, and I want to stress that point. Uh, we have made significant progress to achieving the low-carbon vision outlined in our second report on proposals and policies, as demonstrated in the RPP2 monitoring framework published earlier this year. And in June, we announced a package of measures to keep us on track to the 2020 target, including the establishment of a new Cabinet subcommittee on climate change. Stop Climate Chaos Scotland said, uh, and I quote, announcements show the Government is serious about getting us back on track to meet future targets. In, in addition... Uh, our independent advisers, the Committee on Climate Change, have advised that, and I quote, underlying progress remains on track in most sectors. However, uh, despite this progress, I freely acknowledge we have fallen short in meeting our statutory fixed annual tonnage targets. Nobody uh, is more disappointed than I am that this is the outturn. Uh, the annual target report to be laid in Parliament later this month will therefore show that uh, emissions in 2012 exceeded in tonnage of emissions the level required by the annual target set under the Act by just over 2.4 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent. The key factor impacting on our ability to meet annual targets is upward revisions to the baseline against which the amount of abatement and performance against our targets are measured. By summer 2014, the baseline had been revised up by 5.4 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent compared to the data available when the annual targets were first set. This is an upward adjustment of uh, more than 8%, or actually it's 7.7%, I correct myself, uh, convener, between the 2008 based and 2012 based inventories. Revisions are the result of improvements in methodology as there is more accurate monitoring of emissions and understanding of the impact of greenhouse gases improves over time in each successive greenhouse gas inventory. As Scottish Government, uh, Scottish Government paper documenting the uh, key reasons for successive revisions to the greenhouse gas inventory over the last five years was published earlier this week. 
Uh, as a result of these revisions, the fixed annual targets, which do not adjust and are, are as it were, set in stone, are now considerably more challenging than when they were set. While we remain committed to delivering a 42% reduction by 2020 and a minimum of an 80% reduction by 2050, overcoming the methodological issues arising from improvements in data and estimation techniques, rather than material changes in emissions, is a challenge that I would contend needs to be addressed. Our independent advisors, the Committee on Climate Change, uh, have uh, identified two basic options for addressing inventory revisions. First, to adjust targets, for example, by recasting these in terms of year-on-year -year emissions reductions or by revising the targets to allow for adjustments arising from each annual inventory revision, or uh, to adapt to the inventory change by finding additional opportunities to reduce emissions that go beyond current and proposed policies, in effect seeking even deeper percentage reductions by 2020 and 2050 than were chosen by Parliament in 2009, i.e. the 42 per cent and 80 per cent figures. I would welcome the committee's views on the merits of these or other options that the committee may have. Convener, by demonstrating solid progress towards the targets set by our, committee, our, our Climate Change Act and as a progressive partner in international negotiations, I believe Scotland can continue to be a model for the international community by demonstrating op the opportunities of the low carbon economy, which is creating jobs, investment, trade and growth benefits for the people of Scotland. We are by no means perfect, but in a world that faces an enormous challenge, and challenge to avoid societal, economic and environmental damage arising from uncontrolled climate change, Scotland, our country, has shown and continues to show leadership, of, of which I think we can all be proud. Thank you, Convener. Th uh, thank you for that opening statement. Um, we know from the evidence from the UK CCC that uh, Scotland has often made an appropriate contribution, as Dr Uta Collier put it. Um, uh, in her evidence last week uh, to delivering the UK's first carbon budget. But we also know from uh, WWF and many others that whilst the progress in renewables has been excellent, that the efforts with regard to uh, energy efficiency, transport and areas such as renewable heat need a good deal more effort. Now, I wonder if you uh, have a particular uh, concerns that we can attend to these issues and increase our efforts in those areas as part of our ongoing work in climate mitigation? Well, certainly, Convener, I agree that it's an extremely important area for progress. Uh, the Committee on Climate Change have been complimentary about what we're doing in energy efficiency in Scotland. Uh, but I think Uta Collier, uh, Dr Uta Collier last week pointed out um, herself and her, her evidence that in the current situation, she's, she, and I quote, in the current situation, in more, which more devolution is being discussed with Westminster, you could look at these areas. If you really want to deliver in Scotland, you might need to push for more control over these issues. She went on to say, uh, you cannot do much about the energy company's obligation, which is true, uh, it's a reserved uh, area, uh, and that she knew that the Scottish Government has tried to influence DEC, which is true, um, but that she perceived that DEC was not delivering. And I think that, that is a challenge for us. It's not to particularly have a pop at, at, at DEC, um, this is a difficult area for everybody, um, but we may have a, a different approach um, if we had control over uh, such matters and clearly for energy efficiency uh, in tackling not only climate change but our, our fuel poverty uh, targets. This is an extremely important area of, of policy for Scottish Government and it's one that we would want to uh, progress as, as fully and as fast as we can. Uh, computer. I note your remarks with regard to uh, matters that will be dealt with by the Lord Smith of Kelvin. Uh, from various parties' uh, potential inputs to these things. Um, in terms of our own uh, budget in the next period, uh, we'll be discussing some of these in detail uh, once the budget documents are, are, are presented. But we you know, are looking for greater progress. So how do we plan to secure this? on the basis of the resources that we have? <laughs> that, that, that's, a, that's a key consideration, clearly. Uh, we uh, do have um, you know, a high level of investment in energy efficiency in Scotland, but you attack this from a number of different angles. Obviously, the planning system and building regulation has a role in terms of uh, driving building standards. Uh, but we, we have to recognise that um, you know, we have a relatively slow turnover rate in terms of building. There's a, you know, obviously a huge pool of buildings that are already out there, 
and so therefore retrofit is is an extremely important consideration. So therefore, you know, money it does become important there. You can you can change new buildings through regulation, and that is important. And I note for the record that uh, uh, between 1990 and now, uh, we've improved energy efficiency of new builds by about 70 percent. So there's there has been progress made at Scotland level over that period. But the problem is the challenge remains. We've got a lot of old solid wall uh, properties um, around Scotland, uh, older buildings that do need desperately to be uh, retrofit fitted with energy efficiency measures and while there has been great progress in uh, cavity wall insulation where I think two-thirds of properties that could be cavity wall insulated have been cavity wall insulated and uh, a very high proportion of buildings that could receive uh, loft insulation have been insulated we're now running into more difficult properties rural stone built solid wall construction properties and uh, non-traditional designs which is going to be more of a challenge for us. Well this committee knows that rural poverty and uh, fuel poverty is a major uh, issue which needs to be better uh, stated in statistics because uh, if they were I think it might be possible for us to, to see the direction of uh, uh, policies uh, to try and solve them but the hard to heat and hard to treat houses have been known about for a long while. Is there anything specific in this next round of uh, your activities that can give us uh, some security that we understand that this will be tackled? Well, indeed, in June, uh, round about the time of the uh, announcement of the, the figures, we, we did have an announcement by colleagues Margaret Burgess about the allocation of HEAPS funding. Uh, now, £60 million of the £79 million uh, that has been allocated in, in this year is going into uh, area-based schemes across Scotland. Uh, an additional amount within that, an extra £5 million, has been specifically earmarked for off-grid uh, properties, recognising that uh, you know, the options are more limited in terms of improving uh, the uh, heating performance and energy efficiency of, of those properties. So, uh, you know, we are trying to direct more money to harder to treat properties in harder to treat locations where people maybe have fewer options than you would do in an area connected to the gas grid uh, and with, uh, you know, maybe a more available, a bit better, better building design in the first place. So it is a challenge, but I'm, I'm confident through the work that's being done by colleagues, uh, Margaret Burgess in particular, that, that, uh, that, that the efforts are being made to tackle these hard to treat properties. Um, Nigel Don wanted a supplementary. Thank you, Vina. Good, uh, good, good morning, Minister. Uh, in that precise context, and I recognise this isn't your portfolio directly, um, there does seem to be a lot of evidence that hard to treat houses are also old houses, and the ones that aren't being treated are in private hands and often rented, which is why there's the least incentive for the person who owns it to actually make it to improve it. Um, could you bring some? encouragement to your colleagues to see whether that we should be legislating in that area because I think that's actually probably what's required if we're going to get older leased properties up to standard many of which are quite simply not even wind and water tight at the moment well we could veer on, uh, Mr Don I mean I, I'm happy to take that issue forward in terms of bilaterals with uh, colleagues in, in housing Margaret Burgess and uh, indeed we're, we're relevant with the local government and planning minister Derek Mackay as well uh, these are important issues. We certainly recognise that regulation can be a driver where there's perhaps no incentive for the individual to uh, to do the work. Um, we have extended, uh, we can get details f for the committee, I think, of government programmes that have been extended to private landlords to try and incentivise them to improve the energy efficiency of boilers and other measures. So there, there have been steps taken to try and make it easier for landlords in private sector uh, rented accommodation uh, in rural areas to, to try and adapt their properties, but I, I will take forward the point Mr Don raises about whether regulation could, could drive that uh, to, to my colleagues' uh, relevant portfolios. Thank you. I think uh, the next questions follow on uh, from that. Graham Day. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, Minister. Uh, hitting the initial targets was always said to be the easy part, that the difficulty increased the further into the process we went. Um, and yet, last week, Dr. Uther Collier of the Committee on Climate Change, in evidence to the committee, set, was talking about a situation where, owing to the EU trading scheme uh, changes and further inventory changes that are coming, we're actually chasing a moving target in reality, and that we're going to have a major, major problem next year. Now, you, you talked about going even deeper in making changes, but to put that in perspective, perhaps, Dr. Collier equated what was needed to insulating uh, every solid wall home in Scotland and all the outstanding cavity wall homes in Scotland in one year at a cost of five to ten billion pounds. I mean, if that's a, a good analogy, isn't this an almost impossible task and don't we need to get realistic here about where we're at? Well, I, I certainly agree we need to be realistic. 
um, about where we're at, both in terms of the resources that are available, but also uh, the mechanics of how the legislation is, is working. And um, I think Dr Collier's point was, uh, you know, particularly um, useful one and just illustrating the scale of the task. Uh, it's not just about the money, it's about how physically you could deliver that amount of retrofit to with a small, uh, a shrunken construction sector during the recession, how you could actually expand the activity quickly enough to deliver that. So there's a there's an actual practicality issue as well as a financial issue. Clearly there are other options, so it's not, I, mean, I think Dr Collier was, from what I saw of the evidence, was, was characterised, you know, pulling it into a, what, a single issue response, if you like, to, to the challenge. How do we make up the shortfall of one megaton? And this is one suggested way as we do it. So we do have more options than that, uh, clearly. But I think it was illustrative of the scale of the challenge. And if we put it in perspective, there's been a lot of focus on the on the missed, the missed targets. And that's entirely right, as the legislation is set up to monitor our performance against, uh, against the uh, net emissions figures after including ETS. Um, ETS has if I can put it frankly, been a bit of a letdown in terms of the, the Europe's um, desire to move to a more ambitious target for 2020. The debate has moved on, as I think Dr Collier and others acknowledged last week, to looking at 2030, and the pre-2020 um, ambition has fallen by the wayside. So we are left with a position where we're reporting it something um, and, and targets which were set on an assumption about going to 30%, which doesn't look like it's likely to materialise. But to give the committee confidence in, in how, how we are progressing, um, I could just read out some figures. I appreciate you want to keep the figures down to a minimum, but I think this is important in terms of the actual uh, emissions. In 2010, our target was 53.65 megatons. Our source emissions, our actual emissions as a country, were 58.3, so we missed by 4.6 megatons. Uh, in uh, 2011, our target was 53.4 megatons. Uh, our actual emissions were 52.5 megatons, 0.9 megatons under the target. Uh, in 2012, the most recent year we've reported on, our target was 53.23 megatons. Our actual emissions were 52.9 megatons, not 0.3 megatons under target. The problem is we're reporting against emissions net of ETS, and ETS adds in emissions, uh, paper emissions that haven't actually been emitted because that's the way the system works. So we are um, reporting it something which is, in some respects, a bit abstract. Um, for people to get their heads around ETS and carbon trading schemes. The actual amount of gas we were pumping into the atmosphere was actually below target in 2012 and 2011, but I fully admit it was well above target in 2010 for reasons that were explained previously about bad weather and so forth. But we, the, 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 the emissions gap, cumulative emissions gap, is about 3.4 megatons in those terms, but it goes up to 7.6 megatons if you take the ETS into account. So it's a very complex picture. It's a very hard thing to get across to the public, very hard thing to get across to stakeholders. Believe me, I've tried. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a complex picture, and we need to get some realism about the point that Mr Day has made. We need to be realistic about our resources and, and the nature of the targets and how they are moving with the baseline position and becoming more challenging because the, the, the actual targets are fixed. And we need to have a mature discussion because this would bind any future administration um, not just ourselves, uh, and get a consensus about how we tackle this, uh, this particularly challenging aspect of, of our legislation. But I am very proud of the legislative framework we have, I'm very proud of the consensus we have in the Parliament about tackling climate change, and I th we're very lucky in that respect compared to other countries. Thanks for that answer, uh, Minister. Uh, interesting figures, but uh, how confident are you that the measures that you've announced earlier this year that, that will be implemented will get us back in track, whether in paper terms and re or real terms. And if they're not, don't we seriously have to look at changing the targets? It may send the wrong message, but don't we actually have to do that? I mean, Dr Collier made the point that she wouldn't suggest changing them in the run up to 2015. Um, that wouldn't be appropriate, but further on that we may have to do that. I mean, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I certainly read that, that evidence with interest, and um, I think Dr Collier, more than perhaps any of us, is well aware of some of the statistical revisions that are likely to come down the line as well. I mean, we have, uh, we know of at least one or two that are going to affect us in the next set of figures in, in June 2015, 
including the uprating of methane from 21 times potency of CO2 to 25. Clearly that's going to have an impact on the agriculture sector and other parts of the economy, the waste sector, where methane is a, an important uh, issue. So we know there are further statistical revisions coming and uh, that will likely make the challenge even harder. The baseline will yet probably get move again. Um, we don't know how we performed against uh, targets in terms of emissions and we won't know until very close to that publication date in June. So um, uh, we're in a bit of a vacuum at the moment as to our performance, but this is the most challenging year, the one we're about to report on in, in June. Uh, and I, I do take the point that Dr Collier and others have made about the sensitivity in running to Paris. And, uh, and I think a number of uh, stakeholders mentioned this last week that um, you know, we have a challenge uh, to try and make sure that there's a kind of a unity of purpose across the world in laying down commitments and it wouldn't look good like other governments have in recent times sort of pulling back from their commitments or being seen to. But what I can say, regardless of what we ever do, and we will take advice from experts like the Committee on Climate Change on their, their view as to how we should proceed. And I'll be listening to Dr Uti Collier's um, views on this in due course. Uh, but we, we will um, you know, be absolutely clear we are not you know, reducing our commitment in terms of tackling climate change. We're absolutely committed to delivering the 42% uh, that we have declared and the 80% we declared. That's really important for the international negotiations that other governments know even though we are sadly not a member state at those discussions, but they know that Scotland is committed to delivering its target, however we manage to achieve that. It's just to recognise that the realistic point, that is getting tougher and tougher to deliver the tonnage target that the legislation requires. But in, I'm very confident in percentage terms that, uh, given our higher baseline, that we are on actually a steeper trajectory at the moment than the legislation actually required of us when the targets were set. So. Um, uh, in a, in, a, in a nutshell, we've got a bigger drop to go down, but we're actually dropping faster than the legislation initially intended. So we're doing our best to close that gap. Um, just as a sorry, good morning, Minister. Morning. Just supplementary to that, and leaving aside all the complexities about how the figures are calculated, um, just generally, how well do you feel that climate change policy fits in with other government policy, and could it be that lack of coherence um, could be one of the reasons that targets are being missed? Well, I mean, it's clearly, uh, it, it's like some other areas of government policy. It's one that is cross-cutting. It crosses, cuts across a number of different departments. I think it's an important issue you raised. Um, one of the reasons why, you know, we, we have the bilaterals is to try and just uncover, you know, where other departments are in terms of the difficulties they have in implementing RPP2. The RPP2 um, document itself was developed jointly with colleagues across different parts of government. So the... Uh, technical officials in each team were asked to sort of come up with their proposed uh, measures that would be able to deliver the 42% target by 2020 and obviously these, the annual targets thereafter up to 2027. Um, <clears throat> so there has been good engagement with officials in other departments. Uh, there are obviously uh, areas where um, I think it's important to emphasise and picking up um, Mr Day's earlier point as well, that we need to make sure that, that proposals get converted into policies, and our colleagues recognise that. It's why I think the Cabinet subcommittee will be particularly uh, useful, both from my perspective, but for colleagues to be able to air any difficulties they're having and to use the collective wisdom, um, hopefully recognise there is some collective wisdom in, in government, um, but we uh, use our collective wisdom to try and come up with solutions, maybe help colleagues and, and see if there's any way we can share the burden. Uh, we don't have sectoral targets in, in terms of the, the climate change legislation in Scotland, and so it's important to recognise that if one part of the economy which is expected to deliver emissions abatement of X doesn't deliver X, then other parts of the economy have to pick up the slack. And so we have to find a response somewhere else. If it's proving challenging to deliver what we intended in one part of the RPP2, we'll need to pick, up it, pick it up elsewhere. So um, in that respect, I think there is a recognition that there's a problem shared uh, and, and we all have a collective responsibility to deliver the targets, but it's, it's always going to be challenging because, um, you know, we, we are asking people to go, uh, you know, faster, harder, and in some respects using technology that's, that's, that's pioneering and perhaps uh, novel in its, in its application, and therefore we are taking risks, and uh, that is difficult because we are a front-runner. Um, it would be easier to be in the pack and, and other countries looking at us and seeing where we're going wrong being able to learn from that, we're the ones that are having to find out by doing it first. Uh, so it is challenging, uh, but I recognise the point you make and it's something that I take forward in my bilaterals, try and encourage colleagues to 
to, to do as much as they possibly can. And no doubt we can reflect that in uh, remarks that we may make to you after this, uh, you know, with regard to the cross-cutting nature of these things. Uh, thanks for that, Cara Holm. Um, Jim Hume. Thank you, and, of course, good morning, Minister. Um, we heard last week when we were taking evidence that there was still scope uh, to secure further action in, in quite a few areas. Um, for example, CPIN, Stop Climate uh, Cures Scotland, mentioned uh, that there was more action could be done regarding peatland. They also uh, said that they would support something like a, a voluntary carbon aud auditing in, in agriculture, although, although we also heard that agriculture had already reduced their emissions by about 27% since 1990 or so. Very opposite with, with, with transport, which is obviously a big polluter, and uh, there was very little change. I think about 1% or so change in, in transport since 1990. And WWF also noted that RPP2 only had one policy uh, regarding transport, so they thought that there should be more action there. Chris Wood G, I mean, you, you mentioned uh, energy efficiency of, of houses, but Chris Wood G of uh, Sustainable Scotland Network, he noted that there was considerable scope existing to improve the energy efficiency of uh, existing buildings. So I'd be interested in what plans that, uh, the Minister had, obviously, to bring forward or, uh, or introduce uh, new policies or proposals in RPT, uh, RPP2 in some of the, these areas or other areas that we could help tackle uh, our emissions for the future? Well, um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that, uh, that Mr Humes raised this because I've heard this often said before that there's only w one sort of policy or one approach in transport and I think we need to recognise that there are um, there is a lot of good work being done in transport. Uh, to, to put it in perspective, had uh, you know, had things gone on unchecked, we'd have probably seen a massive increase in emissions from transport between 1990 and now, uh, because of the higher vehicle ownership. The people are driving further. The, unfortunately, there's a bigger sort of commuter pattern now than there maybe was in 1990. People, suburbanisation continues apace. You know, so there there are there are societal issues which mean that we have got um, uh, increased. Uh, vehicle use. To be fair, obviously, the European Union has tried to improve the energy efficiency of engines, and that has been effective up to a point, but it's not been as effective as we had believed, and all other governments had believed across the European Union uh, when, uh, when the uh, regulations were put in place, because there was an anticipation that alone would have reduced transport emissions. But clearly, people are responding by having more efficient engines by perhaps driving further than they than they would have done otherwise, because they can afford to now. They can afford to do more leisure trips and things. So there's a bit of a, uh, a kind of a spring back, if you like, in terms of uh, mission performance. But I do recognise transport and housing are the two areas probably where we've had the most challenge in terms of delivering substantial uh, incre uh, decreases in, in greenhouse gas emissions. And in the residential sector, we've obviously got the complexity that this is where weather does have an impact on our emissions. And in 2000. And 11 to 2012, and uh, ask officials to correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was about 11% jump in residential emissions because of poorer weather. We saw a similar phenomenon between 2009 and 2010. Um, and while it's dismissed as us having excuses for why emissions are failing to meet targets, and <laughs> I see Mr Hume nodding, um, there is an element there that um, you know, we have to be, to take Mr Day's point, have to be realistic. That is uh, the nature of the beast, and we have to try and influence uh, behaviours. But up to a point, we cannot seriously say to people, don't turn your heating on if they're absolutely freezing, particularly pensioners and others who are vulnerable. So we have to be realistic about where we are. Um, but uh, yes, agriculture has been great progress. Um, I noted Jim Denshin's points last, last week about potentially that plateauing or, or potentially going back the way in ter terms of how agriculture might unfold in due course. Um, but we are obviously trying to explore through things like um, Farming for a Better Climate programme, how we can demonstrate to farmers that it's not only good for for the climate, but actually good for their bottom line to, to uh, deploy improved agricultural practices which lower their emissions uh, as a byproduct. So the prim primary driver for them from a behavioural point of view is this is going to strengthen the finance of your business. Um, but the, ultimately the benefit for us as a society is it lowers emissions. We have got the complexity of methane being uprated, so that may have an impact on what we have to do in due course. But in the June announcement um, of the CAP, uh, the Cabinet Secretary announced uh, that uh, farms, permanent grassland would be asked to uh, to do more in terms of uh, fertiliser management and uh, we'll obviously provide support to those farms 
uh, in doing so, but uh, in terms of advice, uh, how they can achieve that and try and look and make it as simple and as non-bureaucratic as possible. But that's one way in which farmers can actually help the environment by lowering their fertiliser use. But it's actually a very sound thing to do because it will save them money. So if they're using too much fertiliser, they're wasting money. Um, if they're using the right amount, then they're, they're optimising their, their resources and are not wasting money unnecessarily. So we need to find ways, new and innovative ways, and we're constantly trying to review what we're doing. So in some respects, RPP2 is already out of date, um, and we appreciate that, but it still provides a, a, a strategy which departments can, can use to get us there. And uh, you know, in areas like transport, the additional investment made in sustainable active travel in, in June, uh, smarter choices, smarter places sort of funding will hopefully help move us slightly further than RPP2 was showing us. And I know uh, the Minister, Keith Brown, has been working closely with stakeholders in sustainable active travel uh, to look at what the vision would be of Scotland in 2030 and working back from that to find out you know, what is the funding programme, rather than just saying arbitrarily we're going to increase spending each year up to, up to a percentage, looking at what the vision is required and working back from that as to what we have to put in to achieve it. Okay, no thanks. I think there's some others. Sir. Yeah, there are a lot of people who yeah. wanted to come in. Uh, Dave Thompson first, then Alec Ferguson, then Claudia Beamish. Yeah, Dave? Uh, thank you very much, convener. Morning, uh, Minister. <coughs> Just a, a point on transport. Um, a, a number of years ago, uh, the Royal Mail, I think it was, were doing an experiment on uh, hydrogen fueled vehicles uh, running along the northeast of Scotland there from, I think, Peterhead to, to Inverness, and they'd put in the the, the various bits and pieces to allow them to do that. I'm not quite sure where that got to, but it strikes me that the, given our capacity t in terms of our ability to generate electricity and given that there's plenty of water here as well, that, that developing the hydrogen economy uh, is something I think that could help greatly, um, you know, in terms of the, certainly the, 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 the long term reductions in emissions and <clears throat> given that a lot of the electricity is being produced in the north uh, that's where I would like to see a, a, hydro a hydrogen economy based with all the, 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 the jobs and things that would flow for that and I just wonder how much that is actually playing in your thoughts is it is it a sci-fi type of thing that's 10, 20, 30 years away or is it something that you know you feel we should be pursuing uh, in, in the short term well, I, I think um, I'm old enough to remember watching Tomorrow's World and lots of things I thought were sci-fi back then are reality now. Indeed, Star Trek, you know, the personal communicators and so forth, we've got mobile phones. So I think, you know, uh, today's sci-fi can quite often become tomorrow's accepted wisdom and, and uh, main, mainstay sort of technology. And I think hydrogen definitely has uh, potential. I'm not a scientist in that respect, but everything I've seen about hydrogen is very enthusiastic that it, um, it, it, it you know, it has potential to be the, the, the next big, big thing in terms of uh, transport fuels. Clearly we're investing uh, strongly at the moment in uh, infrastructure to support electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles because that is a, um, it could be, uh, it could be the, the, the genuinely the, um, uh, the, the next technology. Uh, at the very least it's going to be a transitional technology. Uh, I, I very much agree with you in respect of the, the aspect that there's no reason why that that technology can't be exploited in a rural region like the like Highlands and Islands, where there's the, obviously the huge amount of renewable energy that could be used to potentially um, uh, be used to, to, to create the hydrogen fuel in terms of the process. And um, we clearly have the ability to use that technology uh, where perhaps you have a surplus electricity being generated at night, if that can be stored through pumped hydro storage, or indeed the fuel can be created at night when it's not being used. Uh, the electricity is not being used, and that would be a very complementary technology to the development of our renewables potential. So I think in a, for a number of reasons, uh, it would be an attractive option to pursue, and it's one that uh, Scotland, if we could take an academic lead in that area, would, would potentially gain the, the employment impacts and the research and development impacts of pursuing that technology. I will just uh, ask my colleagues if they are up to date with them. Is there anything on hydrogen, um, uh, John Island, that, that, that we can say beyond what I've said? No, I think that's... that's uh, but, but, but certainly, <laughs> we can uh, appreciate it's, 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 it's still an emerging area, but we can come back to convener uh, through writing if, if there's anything that colleagues um, can update Mr Thompson on in terms of development of that sector. Um, 
It's just a wee bit logical follow on from that. Um, I asked um, last week about the difficulties of uh, different nozzles for charging points for electric cars. When you're at the EU Environment Council next time, can you ask your colleagues when they're going to get this sorted uh, in your international role that uh, you report back to this committee on? Um, you can see the references in column 23, I think it is, in it, uh, last. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 can, you know, I fully acknowledge that doesn't look particularly sensible from a, from a consumer's point of view. And indeed, clearly, if we're trying to develop a, uh, our tourism offering across Europe and allow people to travel across Europe with uh, sustainable vehicles, then it would make sense to have them able to use the charging points. Um, the good news is, uh, by the end of financial year, we, we hope to have up to 1,200 charging points across Scotland. Um, many of them which will be publicly available. The bad news is people might need a big adapter to be able to use it um, from what, what was said last week, but we, I, I promise I will, I will raise that issue um, if I get the opportunity at, at Council. Thank you very much. Um, we have Alec uh, Ferguson now. Well, um, thank you, Convener, and good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Minister. Um, I wonder if I could return to the field of agriculture for a moment, if I could, which has obviously been asked or is looked on to play quite a large part in this process. And the Minister's already mentioned the Farming for a Better Climate Initiative and indeed the fertiliser efficiency measures that are envisaged within RPP2. And of course, there's always also great stories laid on future technological developments to deliver carbon savings. Um, the, the, what I wanted to ask you about is that all of those measures uh, uh, require voluntary uptake and a great deal of voluntary input. And what I have never quite understood is, unless there is a really good method of monitoring and evaluating how all those things are taken up, it must become extremely difficult to be able to attribute any resultant carbon savings. And I just wondered whether the Minister could expand a little bit on what plans the Government has to monitor these, um, uh, to th these various initiatives, whether there is a thought there that in order to make them more effective, they have to change from being a proposal to a policy, and whether that will therefore take away the voluntary element and, and some of it might have to become compulsory. And I just wonder if you could expand on that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, on, on the last point, I mean, whether something's a, a policy or a proposal doesn't necessarily make, if you change one from one to the other, it doesn't necessarily make it a, a sort of mandatory thing. Uh, that would require you actually to, 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 to make it a mandatory requirement, which is a separate decision. Um, so, uh, you know, if, as things as we take forward measures that have been outlined in agriculture uh, forward and make them firm policies, they are still in many cases assumed to be voluntary rather than, than mandatory. Um, we have done work already uh, in terms of evaluating the effectiveness of farming for a better climate and that's why we have expanded it because the evaluation evidence showed that um, I think 10 or 11 percent improvement in, in uh, carbon efficiency of, of the farms that were taking part. Um, we can get detail to, to the committee if that would be of help, convener, um, in due course, uh, just as to what the messages were from the evaluation. It's a limited evaluation. There's a very small number of uh, monitor farms to, to start with, so I have to recognise that, but we are expanding the, the coverage up to eight uh, monitor farms to try and get a better diversity of farms in different geographies to try and be able to demonstrate um, uh, further the impact of that. Um, in the measures that were announced in June, um, you know, we've also announced a use of uh, uh, farm carbon audits on a voluntary basis and they'll be supported under the new SRDP farm advisory service. So there will be guidance to, to individual farmers as to how to go about um, undertaking a, a, a carbon audit if, if they are obviously wanting to volunteer to do that and, and that's important to get that across. We're not expecting them just to do it off their own back without any support at all. They will be given advice as to how to do that. Um, but, you know, we do need to strengthen the, the monitoring and evaluation because uh, well, there's one aspect of it, I suppose, which is important to recognise that farmers don't necessarily listen to politicians, um, as I'm sure we all recognise, shock horror, um, but they will uh, potentially listen to their peers. So, um, you know, I've, I've been to visit one farm down the borders, I certainly recommend to, to, to Claudia Beamish and others, and Jim Hume, if he hasn't already been there, I'm sure he probably has, to Robert Neal's farm at Upper Nisbet, um, which is a good example of how a farmer, by doing this, can actually then communicate to his peers in language they understand, accept, and in a convincing way, in a way that a politician very much can, and not one like myself who doesn't have a farming background. So I think um, it's important we recognise the role of peer, uh, peer groups and, um, you know, and, and seeing what they, they can do. But I recognise the point that as much monitoring and evaluation information we can put out there in the public domain might help influence decisions on a voluntary basis to do something similar. Um, and uh, in 2013, uh, we undertook a formal data gathering exercise on the uptake of a range of the 
measures that the Farming for a Better Climate programme has been piloting through a national survey uh, and further analytical work will take place to, to refine our assumptions of uptake of these measures in informing delivery of RPP2 clearly. Uh, and we're also working with Struck uh, to better understand the distribution of Farming for a Better Climate uptake uh, across Scotland. So the effectiveness of that peer message, if you like. So we'll try and get more to you Can on I that. Yes. A brief follow up, um, convener, if I may. Thank you. And I'm grateful to the Minister for that explanation. And I mean, I, I absolutely don't wish to um, try in any way to un undermine the, the value of these initiatives that are being put in place. But the, if I could just specify one particular initiative, which is the, the fertiliser efficiency measures, the, the, there, there is a great deal of weight given to the fact that apparently a 90% uptake of those efficiency measures will um, start in 2018. And, and therefore, there is in all the documentation and the forecasts, there is an allocation of carbon saving c uh, given to that measure. How on earth do we know there's going to be a 90% uptake? I, I appreciate that's a guess, but unless there is really effective monitoring, um, it, it will be impossible to know what the uptake is. And I, I just really, you have sort of answered that. But I just yeah, yeah, I mean, obviously, we, we need to work hard to try and get as much coverage of carbon audits as possible to, to um, then be able to scale up from the audits as to what we expect the whole of Scotland to be doing. And we also need to understand whether people who are doing a carbon audit are typical of those who aren't doing a carbon audit. So there's a lot of ifs in there. Um, you know, clearly, we... we we need to look at how we can influence uh, farmers to, to do this. And I, I, I've always maintained that it's better to try and do this through voluntary action if we can. Um, I'm, I'm confident that farmers do recognise the, the importance of this, but if we can use a behavioural kind of approach and sort of encourage farmers to do this, because it's actually a pretty smart thing to do from their farm's point of view, actually it's a, it's a pretty daft thing to be wasting money if you can avoid wasting money. And if you can point out the relevance um, of doing a carbon audit, uh, not necessarily just from a greenhouse gas pr perspective, important though that clearly is, uh, but also from the point of view of strengthening their farm business, then hopefully we'll get a, a higher take-up. Whether we achieve 90% or not um, is something we'll need to work on between now and then and try and encourage and, and interact with the NFUS and other stakeholders on how effective this policy is. But, um, you know, we, we are... Through, uh, through the interaction with um, stakeholders in the run into the June announcement, you know, we have uh, taken forward the approach in terms of permanent grassland and having sort of uh, nutrient management effectively measures brought into permanent grassland, which is accelerating something that was in RPP2 in effect, bringing that forward to, to start uh, in 2016, subject to agreement of, of the European Union. I've, we've yet to sign off, obviously, on, on, on the CAT package. Body okay. agreement. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, Minister. Uh, I, I was actually going to ask about the agricultural issues because of the, um, the serious concerns uh, about the contribution to emissions. And so I'm pleased that my um, colleague, um, Alex Ferguson, has asked that question. But I, I do still have concerns about whether there will need to be regulation because a lot of the issues that... Are, a lot of the very good practice that's being taken forward through the climate... Um, monitor farms and through the voluntary carbon audits are quite, uh, will make an impact, but uh, how, how do we actually, we'll have to wait and see, I suppose, how they, how they roll out, but I, I do have concerns. I want to highlight that point that I, I don't think we should be in any way ruling out regulation if we have to go down that road. For the record, and, and, and apologies to Mr. Ferguson, I should probably have said this when he was asking the question as well, that, you know, we... Um, we could resort to mandatory measures if, if there's insufficient progress, and I think the industry recognises that. Um, you know, we do have powers under, I, th I believe, um, we need to check the detail, set me right, um, Jim and, and, and John, if I'm wrong, under Section 44 of the Act, I think, to, to bring in mandatory measures if necessary uh, to deliver on our climate change targets. But whether it's applicable here or not, we'll need to, to ask the lawyers whether that would, that would work. But, um, you know, there's, I think there's a recognition that... Um, Farmers understand that if there's insufficient progress, then we may need to take mandatory uh, measures and put them in place. We have to also recognise that while agriculture is a very important part of our emissions today, it will be a huge share of our residual emissions in 2050 because we have the, the twin objectives, if you like, of maintaining livestock production and maintaining livestock numbers, but at the same time delivering climate change mitigation economy-wide. So the, the agriculture by necessity will will become a bigger and bigger component of what's left in terms of emissions and more and more emphasis will then probably fall on farmers, um, fairly or unfairly, to, to deliver on our climate change targets. So I hope that we can use behavioural aspects and point out this is actually a very smart thing to do from a farmer's perspective and save them money, 
but at the same time we have the backstop we could use mandatory uh, powers to do so if necessary uh, thank you. Could I come back to you, Chief? Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, ju just to expand the, um, the areas that are, are under discussion, which have been touched on briefly already uh, this morning, Minister, could, could I ask a broader question about whether you have concerns about um, funding for research in relation to what you've already referred to as pioneering technology? And if, if I could just very briefly use the example of... of how it is an evolving issue, as you, of course, know, Minister. But in relation to peatlands was um, highlighted in RPP1 and now has gone from proposals to policies, quite rightly. Um, and marine is now in P RPP2 and will hopefully be, uh, I would expect, should be in the future. But I'm really wondering whether you can give the committee some reassurance about the, the funding um, for, for moving these big policies through in the future. Uh, absolutely, uh, com committee and, and convener and, and, and Ms Beamish. I mean, the blue carbon um, is an area that uh, is probably about where we were at with peatlands in RPP1 terms, in that at that stage in RPP1 we didn't know <clears throat> sufficiently, you know, what was possible and what sort of emissions were related to peatlands and, and, and importantly, what sequestration you could get from investment in rewetting peatlands. And that's still an emerging area. There's still, as, as you probably know, uh, some work to be done on uh, developing Scotland-specific figures for, for peatland restoration that will then further inform policy. Um, but in blue carbon terms, we have had some work done. I think it was SNH, was it SNH? Yeah, SNH have done some preliminary work for us on looking at the significance of um, uh, sea, seagrass meadows and kelp forests and uh, other uh, areas of the economy. Thank you. Uh, in terms of uh, the significance to Scotland, it does look like it has a potential to be a very significant um, uh, asset for Scotland in terms of tackling climate change but we are not yet there in terms of understanding fully what types of activities and what type of investment would be required. But, for example, shellfish production and uh, seaweed harvesting might be two areas in which you could invest as an economy and actually sequester a lot of CO2. Um, we know that shellfish, as they grow, sequester CO2 in their shells. Uh, seaweed, obviously, as a, as a, as a plant, um, does does absorb CO2 in its in its growth. So there are potential sectors there, but we're just not ready enough yet. But I do um, uh, commit to, to Ms Beamish that we are interested in, in finding out more about that, and I will fulfil my commitment if I'm still here uh, in terms of RPP3 to make sure that we, we flag up the opportunities in blue carbon. It's a very important area of emerging policy in the European uh, Union. And uh, Commissioner Protochnik, who's obviously an outgoing commissioner, was very interested in the blue economy and, and what we can do uh, to tackle environmental degradation of our seas, but also to improve its performance in tackling climate change. Thank you. <coughs> okay. um, Graham Day has a supplementary again on this. Yeah, uh, briefly, um, thank you, Convener. J just to, to be clear on something, Minister, I understand what you say about taking the voluntary approach with the agriculture industry, but it's an industry that receives very large sums of public money, and surely it's, we're entitled to expect a sizable contribution in this area. So can I be clear, it, would there be any barrier if the government so chose to making the carbon audits mandatory and linking performance to payment levels in the next cap, by which I mean anyone who has performed well will have made savings anyway and be financially advantaged. But when we get to the next cap, the poor performers could be penalised. Well, um, I, I suppose the, the, the simple answer to that is that you know we, we clearly could um, put more emphasis on carbon audits uh, in, in due course. Um, we've certainly announced in terms of uh, the measures on nutrient management that we will ultimately move to a situation where we would need people to, to have a, a plan, a sort of fertiliser management plan or something along those lines as part of the, the requirements um, for those. And you can obviously link issues through cross-compliance and other measures to to, to the common agriculture policy. I mean, if, if it would help, I mean, we can come back um, with the Cabinet Secretary's assessment of what he would be uh, able to do, what powers he has to be able to do that uh, without actually committing to doing it, just so you're aware of, of what, what we could do as a Parliament, if Parliament wished us to go down that route. Um, but I do think it's a really important point that um, you know a lot of subsidy goes into agriculture, uh, rightly, because we need to produce food and we need food security. Um, but at the same time, that gives us some influence on 
on, on how that is delivered and how we can encourage uh, good practice to be to be um, disseminated and, and taken up by others. That. That's uh, very good. Um, we're going to look at EU emission targets now, and uh, Angus Macdonald's a question. Okay, thank you, uh, convener. Good morning, Minister. Um, I think you used the term uh, or the word mercifully in your uh, preamble this morning uh, with regard to uh, increasing support for a 40% uh, EU reductions target by 2030. Um, now, we, we already know that uh, according to the emissions projections uh, set out in RPP2, the only scenario that uh, will result in annual emissions targets being met every year up to 2020 uh, requires that all policies and proposals um, uh, will be implemented and that also that the EU adopts a 30 per cent reduction target. Um, first of all, would, would you agree that a 30 per cent reduction target is off the table? Uh, and what implications does this have for Scotland meeting its future annual targets, especially if the, the setting of a 40 per cent target doesn't materialise? Well, I, I, um, I suppose the straight answer is I don't think it's entirely off the table, but I think the reality is it's not likely to materialise. So uh, in all, all intents and purposes, I don't think we'll get a 30 per cent target now, uh, which will be a pity. I think the debate has moved on. There's obviously some countries in the European Union who are pushing back even on a 2030 target and ambitions for 2030. Uh, and I think the real politic of it is the debate has moved on to trying to secure um, as much ambition as possible within the European Union amongst those obviously less less ambitious countries uh, to get them to commit to something for 2030. I, I greatly regret that because I think pre-2020 ambition is going to be essential. However, um, you know, we have to recognise that uh, you know, at least some progress has been made. And so I think mercifully we are, as I say, getting to a position where uh, the key parties at the negotiations, including the European Union um, and uh, uh, the, the many other developed countries that have up to now been um, uh, more progressive, are now being joined by uh, other countries, particularly the larger emitters, who are now looking like they are serious about coming to the table with, with an offer themselves. So I think we are in a better position than we were this time last year. Um, I regret that we are looking like we're not going to get uh, sufficient ambition at EU-wide level. There are some very progressive countries in the European Union that would dearly have loved to have gone to 30% or more for 2020, and we would have been one of them. But uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the reality of the negotiations is that that seems to have been left by the wayside. So we have to push as much as we can to get a steeper trajectory for 2030 as possible. Um, we share the UK's uh, ambition that that should be 50% if a global deal is on the table. Um, the, uh, the agreement to date by the European Union appears to be settled at 40%, um, but I would certainly encourage the European Union and members of the European Union to, uh, to consider laying on the table a 50% offer if a uh, globally uh, ambitious deal is on the table uh, to help secure that. Um, we know that Scotland has set annual targets up to 2027, so we're already committed to about 58% emission reduction by 2027. Uh, the initial targets were set on the principle that we should try and achieve, although this is not yet a formal target, 60% by 2030. So we are well ahead again of the pack in terms of emissions. We've done it unilaterally, unconditionally. I've communicated that to um, uh, all the key players in the negotiations in Lima. Uh, including the COP president, uh, the Commissioner Hedegaard, uh, who's an outgoing commissioner, and uh, and others, just to say this is this is Scotland's offer. We we've, we've made it. We're we're sticking to it. 42% by 2020 and 58% by 2027. So they understand we we are uh, committing to that and try and help encourage others to follow suit. Okay. Uh, thank you. Of course, it's not just. Um it's not just other countries within the EU that, that have, have lower ambitions. Um, it would seem it's also the case in, in the UK. Um, uh, you, you may have noticed criticism in Wales uh, over the Welsh Government's uh, climate change performance. Um, and uh, indeed, in, 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 in Wales, there seem to be Labour backbenchers and indeed a, a former Environment Minister uh, calling for a, a statutory framework. Uh, and there are serious concerns that the current trajectory in Wales uh, will fail to reach its target of a 40% reduction in carbon emissions by 2020. Um, are you aware of the difficulties that they're experiencing uh, down there? And, uh, I, I am. Um, I, uh, I was quite surprised when I saw um, Alan Davies's comments. Um, obviously, uh, 
now he's he's free to express himself. Um, he's clearly expressed concern about the Welsh uh, Welsh government's targets. I think it's an interesting choice he's presented to to, to his colleagues in Parliament that they have a choice as to which approach to take. He's certainly recommending a legislative framework from what I've seen. He's suggesting that they can either go down the same route as Scotland and having annual, uh, or at least a statutory framework involving annual targets, uh, or do a carbon budget like the UK government um, have, have done, which is obviously easier to, to meet and is probably quite telling that other governments around the world tend to be picking up that example rather than our own, um, because ours is stricter, it's harder, it's tougher. I experience on a regular basis, as you know. Um, and uh, I think it's why it's really important and it's very important, I know, to, to our stakeholders, including the international NGOs uh, and, and other sort of local uh, stakeholders that we have as um, strong a, a strong a model that can be deployed elsewhere because they see the actual benefits from the point of view of the accountability of the Scottish Government to the Parliament uh, uh, driving our ambition and I'm not sure there are criticisms around the table. I'm not assuming everyone's supportive of what we're doing. But the, the process itself does work because it does place us under pressure to deliver. And I think that's, a, that's what the world needs. Government's actually being challenged and uh, challenged constructively, but challenged to deliver on their targets. And I think the more governments we can get to pick up our example, the better the world outcome will be. Um, because I think that rigour, the scrutiny of Parliament, as has been demonstrated today by the committee, and others is really important to driving the process, and we need to have you know strong legislation across the world. So the more we can do to make our example as a po positive one as possible for other governments to copy, the better. Um, but it was interesting that Alan Davis is saying that they've not done enough, and Welsh government, of course, as well. It's just important to point out while they have a 40% target, it's only in the areas that are devolved to Wales that they apply that target. So we, we've done, we've applied our targets of 42%, 80% across the entire economy, even areas where we don't have legislative responsibility that are reserved to Westminster and we've gone one extra and we've got international aviation and shipping in there which is uh, which is almost unique I think I think it may well be unique in a global global sense with only government I'm aware of that's actually done that okay thank you Minister. okay um, no supplementaries in that uh, question on uh, emissions data uh, Nigel Don thank you Kavina um, can we see heard that there's a, a, a time lag from uh, compared with, with, with other places, and then it's 18 months after the end of the year before we really get the data. Uh, I'm wondering whether the Minister's had any opportunity to, to talk to the UK Government about whether we can improve that, but I'm also wondering whether, in fact, there are surrogates that we can use. I mean, for example, the, the, the tonnage of beef might well convert into methane by some factor. Presumably, we know how much petrol is sold in Scotland, we, and diesel. we can assume it's all burned. Um, so, what options have you got to improve the data, please? Well, it, it is, a, I know, a source of frustration. I saw the, the evidence last week. It's a source of frustration to stakeholders, to the committee, clearly, and, and no doubt to myself in terms of the fact that, um, ironically, when I gave my first statement on climate change, it was relating to 2010 before I'd even been elected. Um, and uh, that just shows you the, the nature of the time lag that we're dealing with. And, of course, we're debating today figures for 2012, uh, when we were in 2014, so that that is frustrating for us. Um, in terms of the approach that's taken, I understand it's a sort of two-step process. I think it was discussed last week at the committee that um, you have the initial kind of draft figures at UK level, and there is no kind of Scottish set that's created at that time. And it's only when the more precise data is produced at UK level it's then possible to drill down uh, and use estimates of the kind you're talking about to to calculate a Scottish equivalent for the publication that we get, get a few months later in June of each year. Uh, so um, I think there's, I was, I was looking at this issue last night when I was reading, reading the evidence and um, I don't think there is sadly at this moment in time great scope for us to accelerate that process because the, the data on which our figures are based can only be produced once the UK figure, the detailed UK figures are ready because uh, then they have to apply population factors and other, you know, GDP ratios, etc., to, to, to uh, another material. Maybe ask John Allen to, to comment on the detail. The good news is, though, that we are developing our own macroeconomic model, um, which can then be used to inform future uh, decisions. 
being taken by Scottish Government as to investment priorities. So we'll have a much better understanding of how the economy works in terms of um, investment of a million pounds in one area. What does that then mean in terms of uh, uh, carbon impact? And so we'll be able to have a much better understanding of our own economy. But at the moment, we are still reliant on debt producing the figures uh, and uh, to produce them as quickly as possible. But, but maybe John could comment more detail on that. Yeah. <coughs> I think the important thing to, to bear in mind here is that there's a trade-off between timeliness of data and the, the quality of the data in terms of its accuracy. And at the moment, I think we have sort of not an ideal compromise, but we do have a compromise between sort of um, getting the data out as quickly as possible and having relatively robust data. But that data is actually still pretty, you know, the, the, the confidence intervals for that data are still pretty wide. And I fear that any, any sort of attempt to produce a sort of a, a much more timely data series in the same way that you're suggesting which just lead to data which is much, much, much less lower quality <coughs> with much higher confidence intervals and actually would probably confuse us more than help us. Uh, can, can I just explore that, though? Because could, could I just come back to one of the other issues that the Minister mentioned earlier, which, of course, is that once you've shrunk the amount of carbon that you're emitting, then those that inevitably must do so, for example, those producing beef, uh, become, by definition, a larger fraction of what's left. Are you specifically working on, one, how that can be measured, but two, how it can be reduced? I mean, are, are we moving to, to, to the days when beef, for example, are produced in sheds and the methane that goes up to the roof is burned off to CO2 before it's emitted as methane? I'll, I'll, would, be I'll leave. A, would be the chemist's solution yeah. without having to worry about the engineer. I think I would leave that to a subsequent minister to explain that one to the farmers. Um, uh, but uh, gladly, um, but uh, I think I think the the, the position in terms of, certainly in terms of uh, SRDP, we've obviously brought in some measures specifically to help the beef sector um, through a ch challenging transition in terms of cap, and one of the rationales for doing that is to try and help make the beef sector more efficient, uh, both in terms of its um, uh, use of materials and. and but we're also doing work through research strands, picking up um, Ms Beamish's point earlier on, on the channel name Green Cow Project and various other uh, areas. So, you know, there's a lot of work being done to try and um, look at the uh, methane performance, if I can put it that way, of uh, uh, trying to think polite ways of expressing it, uh, of, of uh, ruminants such as cattle uh, to reduce the emissions that they're in or thereof. Um, so... So you know we have a we have a challenge um, to to be there, but but in terms of the um, the measurement, if I can perhaps uh, ask uh, John or or Jim if they know of anything that's being done to improve the measurement of the uh, the, the data. I think the there is um, you know one of the reasons we have so many revisions in in, in, in the data and these upward revisions is actually that there's, there's a very thorough program of statistic, statistical research going on to improve the quality of the data, and as we learn more about the science, we get better accuracy of, of, you know, the emissions that we, we actually managed to measure go up. So, yes, um, there is a significant amount of research going into sort of measurement, uh, particularly in areas where the, the, the quality of measurement is, is less good than the, we would like. Um, and you can see the evidence of that in that the data is revised backwards and it creates this issue of upwards revision. So there's a lot going on here, yes. OK. Um, Claudia Beamish wanted to ask about that. Yeah. Right. Uh, thank you, Convener. It, it's a brief supplementary, Minister, just about the compatibility of data in relation to uh, its collection from the public sector and also private sector and also the whole range of sectors, about how that can be moved forward and what progress is being made on that. Uh, it's very important important area. I mean, obviously, uh, as, as Claudia Beamish will be aware through, through the Peace Glaf group, that, that we are doing work in the public sector to try and improve the consistency of record, recording and reporting. Uh, and indeed, we are looking at uh, potentially making uh, a mandatory, uh, mandatory provision for, for reporting in the public sector, not just local government, which you know, um, is already doing a, a relatively good job in reporting on, on such matters, but trying to get consistency of how within local government they report that data so it can be aggregated up and, and used in uh, assessing our performance against RPP2. Clearly we have to do something similar in the uh, private sector. It's really positive we have got the likes of the Climate uh, 2020 group of businesses that are working with us and are, are participating in Peace Glass, so they're aware of the agenda that, that's, that's unfolding on a public sector basis. And um, Ian Marchant was attending the most recent uh, meeting of that group and, her, and was able to put forward the business perspective of what they do as well. Uh, uh, as well. But we are 
in this area and indeed in biodiversity uh, duties, trying to look at how we can develop um, a template that, that companies can use. Uh, hopefully, obviously some bigger companies will be very well resourced and they'll have internal specialists that can help provide lots of information. And that is true of public sector too. Um, but smaller companies, you need to have something that's possible for them to, to deliver as well. So perhaps it's building around a kind of core of information. It would be good to see uh, listed companies reporting their performance against climate change um, and then having the ability for people to augment that if they, if they feel that something they want to do from a corporate social responsibility point of view or because, you know, that's part, a core part of what they do as a business. So I think there, we need to kind of um, find exemplars. Um, the Scottish Government itself... Uh, we are we are by no means the finished article, but we want to become an exemplar organisation ourselves to try and demonstrate to others how we will report on these matters and how we will uh, demonstrate what we do. I do flag up when I mean, people forget that you know organisations like SEPA um, and SNH are ultimately sort of businesses. They may be public sector businesses, but they are operating in a very business-like way, and they have shown the way in terms of how they report on, on uh, climate uh, climate action that they are taking as organizations uh, warts and all and they, they you know they, they, they open themselves up to criticism by doing so but at the same time it's been commended by WWF and others as being the right thing to do because they are showing what is possible and taking a lead um, I think you have another question now on the cabinet please go ahead uh, you, you've already referred minister to the um, the new um, Cabinet Subcommittee on Climate Change, which you announced in June. And uh, could, could you tell us a little bit more, um, as, as appropriate, you know, uh, a, a, about that, and uh, particularly in relation to the delivery of, obviously, RPP2, which we're looking at today, and the delivery of future climate um, emissions targets, particularly um, wondering whether there are discussions about... Uh, issues which may be politically challenging for all parties, such as in transport demand um, uh, issues, um, such as um, low emissions um, zones and um, road pricing, or indeed what, what alternatives there would be, which has been raised by some stakeholders about CCS, if that doesn't come online. Those are just two examples. You know, Obviously not asking you when it's... It, I don't know if it's a public discussion or not, but I'm not clear on that. But it would be helpful yeah. if you could tell the committee a bit more about it. Absolutely. Um, well, I think the, the most important thing to say is I, I very much um, you know, welcome the creation of that and Cabinet's agreement to, to have a subcommittee. I think it provides the uh, you know, the, the obviously the delegated decision-making powers that, that, that come with a, a Cabinet subcommittee. It involves all of the ministers who have um, a role to play. It doesn't mean that other ministers are not um, responsible for climate change duty. I'll put that on the record, convener, um, for future reference. But uh, it does uh, allow us to, 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 to make use of the time of those who've got some portfolio responsibility. And that includes ones that you might not think of, including Alistair Allen, who's education, but because it has a research you know, uh, role in terms of the academic research community, but also obviously schools and and, and the education institutions have got a, a role to play in helping deliver this too. So there's a full range of, of ministers involved that we believe should have a, an insight and, 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 a, and a, a, an opportunity to speak from a portfolio perspective on this. It is importantly connected to the work of the Climate Change Delivery Board. The Climate Change Delivery Board is clearly charged with one of the governance changes that took place as a result of the RPP2 process. The Climate Change Delivery Board has responsibility um, at a, a senior official level within government to, to monitor performance against delivery of RPP2. Uh, and you've seen that in terms of the sort of initial work that's, that's come out in terms of the reporting on, on progress, uh, warts and all, as to how we're doing in relation to RPP2. So the Climate Change Delivery Board uh, is doing the day-to-day -day monitoring, if you like, of what's happening on the ground. The, the Cabinet Subcommittee can then give political leadership to that group and, and obviously be a, uh, an, uh, a forum for problems being brought to, to the Cabinet Subcommittee to say there's a challenge in this particular area of policy delivery and Cabinet can then have a... Um, you know, a, a, a full and frank discussion about where we go in terms of delivering on, on that objective. So as to specific issues that might be discussed, um, I cannot, you know, sort of determine what, what cabinet will choose to look at, but, uh, you know, we will be able to explore all the options that government has available to it, politically difficult or not, or otherwise, uh, in trying to achieve our target and, um, uh, and, and, and to make sure that the delivery is as robust as possible. 
Uh, but there will be quite clear linkages between that climate change delivery board and indeed below below that obviously we've got the peace Claff group and the um in parallel with that i should say rather than below peace Claff group and the clog group which is the officials in in local government sector and, and public sector bodies so there's a number of different strands but with the cabinet so committee sort of providing political leadership to that process okay no further supplementaries on that uh, Minister, when you're here just now, I want to ask you a question about severe weather events, um, which you know, have been mentioned in the context of uh, the increase in our emissions for RPP2, but uh, the severe weather events that uh, have battered the north of Scotland this week, coasts, homes, harbours and indeed shipping, um, have uh, meant that uh, you know we need to be able to monitor these things very carefully. Minister, be aware of the uh, engine failure of the Danish registered vessel Parada, which was transporting irradiated cement from Scrabster to Antwerp, which uh, drifted towards the Beatrice oil platform that had to be evacuated and has now been taken by a tug in the direction of the Cromarty Firth. Has the Minister any further information about the effects of severe weather effects uh, on our homes, coastal homes, harbours and at sea? Uh, we'll convene in, in the course of there will have been a, an update produced just at half past ten, which I will have, have missed. But uh, notwithstanding that, uh, we know there was uh, some damage uh, from the severe weather yesterday in Mr. Don's constituency, and there were the properties evacuated along Stonehaven uh, uh, waterfront there because of the, the uh, tidal surge and overtopping at, at Stonehaven, which is obviously a concern to, to residents of Stonehaven. Uh, a number of properties experienced um, relatively minor flood damage thankfully uh, but does obviously affect the individual's concern and my, my sympathies go to them in terms of their the, the property damage but the incident that you refer to uh, with the the, uh, the vessel that's transporting nuclear waste is obviously an issue of concern I know the cabinet secretary said he's wanting to to meet with the office of nuclear regulator as soon as possible to discuss um, the arrangements uh, whether or not the vessel was seaworthy clearly if a uh, and I've no reason to believe it wasn't seaworthy um, the fact that it had a fire on board meant it, it drifted and in those weather conditions that becomes a serious challenge because I know uh, workers on Beatrice platform had to be evacuated in case the vessel hit uh, the uh, installation there so it clearly has implications for others it has implications for the environment and I'm sure the cabinet secretary were taking uh, taking this very seriously in terms of um, discussions with the office of nuclear regulator to make sure arrangements are, are better uh, in the future thank you very much for that just now um, that being the end of the questions just now, I'd like to thank the Minister and his officials for uh, exploring this issue with us. Uh, we're very keen to make sure that uh, we have uh, as much knowledge of this as it's an ongoing matter of the utmost importance. So thank you, Minister. We will now have a short break, uh, both changeover witnesses and uh, for a comfort break, just now five minutes.
So, agenda item three today is for the committee to take evidence from the Crown Estate in its annual session with our committee. And we welcome uh, for the Crown Estate Gareth Baird, the Scottish Commissioner, uh, Ronnie Quinn, the Lead for Energy and Infrastructure in Scotland, and Alan Laidlaw, Rural and Coastal Portfolio Manager for Scotland. Welcome, gentlemen. I don't know whether you have any uh, initial remarks to make, Gareth. A brief one, convener, yes, certainly. if we may. Thank you. Thank you, convener, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We're delighted to be here again for what is our third annual appearance before this committee. These appearances have been helpful in enabling us to understand your perspective, and your quest questioning has prompted changes in how we work, and in particular how we report that work. Two years ago, you questioned the fact that round three of offshore wind in Scotland, which is beyond 12 miles from shore, was not included in the finance section of our Scotland report. This is something that we addressed. And last year, some of you asked how we engage with communities, particularly in the context of our local management agreements. Again, we've made significant progress with more agreements coming through and a charter on good engagement that we are now set to finalise shortly. Offshore renewables remain central to our work in Scotland and the consenting of Murray Firth offshore wind projects, which includes the first round three project to reach this stage in the United Kingdom, was a huge milestone for the industry. Equally, we were very pleased that our investment, alongside that of the United Kingdom Government, Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise, in the Maygen Tidal Energy Project off the Caithness Coast, means that the first phase can proceed, opening the way for Scotland to play a leading role in the development of larger commercial tidal schemes that can make a real contribution to future energy needs. However, there are major challenges ahead in this sector and we are working with industry partners on cost reduction, which is critically important if we are to maintain investor and developer confidence in projects. You will have received our Scotland report on our work in the last financial year. We are very keen to address any questions you may have on this or indeed any other aspect of our work. Thank you. Convener. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> we'll start off the questions, I think, with Graham Day. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Kavir, and good morning, gentlemen. Just, just a couple of scene-setting questions, really, uh, emanating from the 2014 report. I, I know that the current total property value is given as 267 million, which uh, <coughs> compares with 237.3 million the previous year, which is quite a leap. I wonder if you can maybe outline for us how that's been uh, arrived at. And I'm particularly interested, given the previous session the committee's just had on climate change in the suggestion that greenhouse gas emissions from the Crown Estate has been reduced by 3% overall. Just briefly, if you could outline how you achieved that and how you intend to maintain or improve that uh, performance in uh, coming years. If, if I may, uh, the increase in uh, capital value, you'll see from the, the figures, is a, a large part of that is due to the increase in the renewables capital value uh, and that's not totally unexpected because just at the tail end of this reporting period we had the uh, consents coming forward for the Maury Firth area as Gavin mentioned earlier on. So they're still discounted in our uh, accounts uh, but it, it takes it into another bracket if you like uh, and that has a, had a substantial increase uh, effect on the, the capital valuation of particularly the offshore renewable side. Uh, so far as the, um, the, the work that we do ourselves, uh, we've initiated uh, a green workplaces uh, initiative within all our offices. And... Uh, Small things, um, you know, we, we have quite a lot of recycling in the offices now. Um, various other initiatives uh, throughout the office, uh, you know, switching off laptops, switching off monitors, all that kind of thing does add up and um, reducing our use of um, bottled water, things like that. So we have a, 
an in-house team that's coordinated across the Crown Estate, and we've got a small team in Bells Bray, here in Edinburgh, and um, they work uh, across the piece to try and reduce our impact across, across the environment. So, so that suggests you've, you've done what you've done, and you are where you are, but how are you going to build upon that? Um, I'm not on the, the Green Workplaces Committee myself. I don't think Alan is either, but um, uh, I know there was another meeting last week. Uh, I don't know what new initiatives will be coming forward. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know. I, I think I could possibly add to that. Uh, our Chief Executive, Alison Nimmo, um, his, his uh, sustainability absolutely runs through her veins, and she has driven this very hard. And there's a sustainability discipline right across the business now in everything, uh, uh, everywhere we act. So um, there will be um, uh, an incre a re consistent level of increased focus on that. That, um, and I dare say, hopefully, that will uh, bring benefits forward. It's probably worth saying also, you know, in terms of the, um, the, the core team in, in our business, the actual office premises and, and our activities compared to the other interests that we are involved in are, are quite small. And I think a lot of the, the work that we are looking to do on, on climate change and carbon reduction is actually on, in terms of influencing um, our tenants and, 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 and helping inform that debate. And I think you know we've got an important role to play in that in, in terms of interpretation of some of the science and policy into reality on the ground. And that's where I think you know I could um, cut water use in our office for 38 staff by 100%. But if 10 of my farmers on the ground continue to do different things, that would be a, a, a you know a, a tiny difference that they could make. So a lot of what we're trying to do is to, to influence those behaviours. So can I ask, would you encourage actively your tenant farmers to carry out carbon audits on their farms? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I know a lot of them have and are already engaged and, and the early adopters are, are doing it. And, in, and, you know, they're right down the precision route and, and, and um, use of, of fertilisers and, and, and inputs. And then there's a, there's a romp that are, are looking at it from a different perspective. And we're trying to uh, inform that. And actually, we've got a workshop with our livestock producers in um, early November with Morden, um, the research centre, and we're working in partnership with them to, you know, talk about efficiency and, and um, diseases and, and all that sort of stuff to make sure that you know output per methane producing body is as high as possible. Um, and I think, from from my point of view, and, and in particular in the rural estate, that's where uh, that we can make real differences rather than a 50% reduction in maybe water in the office, because actually it only needs two or three burst pipes and two or three days of people ignoring them to completely mitigate any benefit that we do. So I think that's a key point from my point of view. Yeah, thank you. That's encouraging. Um, we've got several uh, supplementaries in this. Dave Thompson, followed by Jim Hume, and then Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, convener, and uh, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, it's in terms of... Um, property value and, and, and you know what you actually include in that because obviously you have the seabed. Um, do you only value seabed where you've got a license uh, issued to somebody or do you look at the total seabed that you have and place any value in that because obviously uh, around the shores of Scotland there's a massive amount of seabed that, that you, you own and a ma massive potential. Um, and, and I just wonder, uh, you know, if that shouldn't be valued in, in some way rather than purely when somebody asks you, can they do something on it, and you then get a rental or, or do whatever you do. We use the Red, Bro Red Book valuation principles, um, and it's done by an independent valuer or a team of independent valuers. But in essence, the valuations are only uh, applied to those areas of the seabed where we have some activity and some uh, lease or agreement for lease activity. <coughs> Va valuing the wider, the wider aspect would be, um, I think, out with the, the Red Brook, the, mm -hmm. the, the industry standard norm, if, if you're not going to be deriving a value or a benefit from it, it would be difficult to value that under the Red Book rules. Mm -hmm. Maybe if I could just follow up uh, uh, briefly, convener, 
Um, fair enough, I can understand and, and accept what you're saying there. But uh, if, if you know someone has an estate uh, in the Highlands or whatever, that estate is worth whatever it's worth, irrespective almost of what's happening on it. If there's very little happening on it, it still has a value. Uh, the value would change if other things are happening. I just wonder that... Um, if you shouldn't be in, I mean, you know, you have your figures in here for current total property value, 267 million, which represents 3% of the UK total. But I would imagine that the potential value of your seabed, of your estate, if you like, uh, and in terms of comparing it with, with the rest of the UK, because there's so much shoreline in Scotland and because of the amount you know you have, that that value would be actually um, pretty large in comparison with... Uh, I just wonder if it wouldn't be a useful um, measure uh, for us to have, e even if you only quantified the area, you know, in, in comparison with the rest of the UK, so that we would get an idea of the potential value of that if there were further developments. I think it. it's certainly something we could do is um, identify the, the square kilometre uh, of, of the seabed. Um, but I, I think the valuers, and Alan will probably have more to say on this than I, the valuers, I think, would find it very, very difficult to put a value on something where there wasn't a recognised foreseeable income stream. There's just no, as I understand it, under the Red Book rules, it, it's, it would become um, very, very contentious as to what that valuation would be. It's probably worth saying that it also, if there isn't an active interest or an agreement, it carries a management responsibility and potentially with that management responsibility, maybe other views that there might be liabilities uh, as well. Um, and, and therefore, that's where the, the sort of RICS Red Book guidance would get into to some difficulty in, in, in creating value there. Um, so I think the, the quantifiable quantum of what we manage and look after, that's absolutely possible. I think um, in particular on the, on the coastal estate where uh, I'm responsible for, and there are many areas that are long stretches of coastline that have limited value because there are limited interests. Um, so I think just to put a, a blanket sort of rate per kilometre of foreshore would uh, probably be slightly disingenuous, uh, and, and I certainly wouldn't like to see that in our accounts. Um, Claudia Beamish is so a supplementary in this area, is it? Yep, yeah, OK. And then Jim, I think, wants a different area. Yeah. Thank you, convener. Uh, good morning to you all. Uh, could I ask you um, about the general duty of the CEC? And I understand that's under the Crown Estate Act of 1961, which is certainly some time ago, um, even for someone like myself. Um, and can I quote that... It, it, I understand it says that while maintaining the Crown Estate as an estate in land, and then goes on to say, to maintain and enhance its value and return obtained from it, but with due regard to the requirements of good management. Um, I'm wondering if any of you could comment on um, whether, obviously this is part of an act, but uh, so it would require legislation to alter it, as I would understand it, although I stand to be corrected on that, but whether um, there's any consideration of um, changing this duty to move it forward into um, today in relation perhaps to um, a carbon commitment or a social remit or um, sustainable development or other duties, um, and even if that was only within a mission statement, and there may well be um, plans afoot or there may well be um, ways in which this is being brought forward anyway so that there is some sort of a statement that is um, more for today I think with um, with regard to the act um, we are just wholly directed by that and um, really that's for governments to consider whether there's any change all I could assure you was if um, if we go back to the uh, if you like, the strap lines of the Crown Estate, which are commercialism, integrity and stewardship. So the assets that we are uh, entrusted to manage by the nation, um, we have to take a commercial view on that. And we very much hope there's lots of examples I hope we can bring to your attention later today where that's a win-win uh, for everybody. And we have to do any commercial activity 
with a long-term view, if you like. So there's the stewardship part of it, and we have to do it in an open and transparent, transparent fashion. As far as the, the sort of carbon footprint of that is concerned, all I could do is really refer back to our uh, earlier comments where our chief executive has brought this sustainability view and, uh, and way of working to the whole team and to all the estates that are all the sectors of the Crown Estate. Um, so I, all I can absolutely assure you is that the, the carbon footprint part of that is absolutely taking precedence now. Thank you. And in terms of, of that and a, a more focused social remit, which last year and the year before has been increasingly highlighted to us, do you think it's possible to have some sort of a statement that the public could look at to engage with that commitment? I think, um, I've said to, to the committee before when we discussed land reform, and it, it takes on from Mr. Thompson's point there, that um, we only can create value in revenue or capital terms when we're doing something with the assets. Um, and because we're not a trading business, we can only do something with our assets with a partner. So that's a community or a developer, or an energy company or a farmer or, or whatever. And I've never seen the two of those as being exclusive to one another. We, we can only create value um, in, in, in our estate and, and in revenue by working in partnership. And I think the case studies in, in the annual report this year reflect that what we do to invest in, in long-term projects creates value beyond that. And I'm really proud of what my team and, and, and the team in Edinburgh and, and around Scotland deliver because we are delivering a commercial return, which we've identified through the Act of Parliament we must do, but the wider impact of those is, is far greater um, through those enabled opportunities. Um, so it, it, there's, a, there's a, a bit of tension, but I don't see a lot of tension in, in, in those areas. And I think that what um, a lot of the activities we do, whether it be you know the mountain biking investment in Glenlivet, which has created more jobs and a long-term tourism hub, or whether it be working with um, communities on LMAs to take their local management agreement, sorry, uh, to take their interests forward, are delivering our requirements under the Act, but actually are also delivering on the ground. There's also seen, um, if I may, on page one of, of this year's report, um, in fairly bold print, uh, where it's set out, our role is to make sure that the land and property we invest in and manage is sustainably worked, developed and enjoyed to deliver the best value over the long term. At the heart of how we work is an astute, considered, collaborative approach that helps us create success for our business and for those we work with. So that's a sort of mission statement type of thing that you were referring to there. And um, just in case we forget it, we're all issued with a little card um, that you know we have with us and I carry it with us, um, putting more values uh, as to how we, how we work and how we, uh, how we do our business. Right, thank you. So do you think that beyond each annual report, would it be appropriate, I'm asking the question, to have a mission statement that brought us into um, today for, for yourselves? Would that be helpful as, in relation to the interface with communities and with, with um, the public? I, I think that's... Yeah, I think we could could work on that, and I think the charter that we're working on engagement with communities would, would help reinforce that. And the toolkit that we brought last year when we appeared was was all about how we get um, a greater understanding of what the desires of the communities are and how we help deliver that. So I, I don't see any issue with that at all. Um, Jim Hume. Yeah, Convener, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, last night, of course, we had the cross-party group on rural policy, and it, it was talking about some challenges for young, younger people and uh, we've mentioned social remit there from, from Claudia and, uh, and stewardship from, from yourselves, etc. We had a bit of an ageing population in some of the rural uh, industries and of course your estates cover agriculture, forestry and farming. I was just wonder what, um, what policies and proposals we could say are, are happening within the, the, the Crown Estate to address some of these issues. If I could kick off, and I'm sure Alan will, will come in later on. Um, this is an area that's very close to my heart, um, and it's one of education uh, at all stages, particularly for the offshore renewable sector. Um, it's evolved. Uh, I started off speaking to uh, people in 
colleges and universities, telling them about how this industry was moving forward uh, and what would be required. And then quickly realised that, to a large extent, many, many of the students there had already made their life choices and where they wanted to go by the time they'd got to college or university. So we started speaking to schools, um, secondary schools in particular, and again realised that this was very good and the, the pupils and the, the young people were very enthused about uh, the industries, particularly because it's, it's not an industry that they can learn about from their parents because it, it wasn't there. Um, we then realised that this was creating a small industry in itself and um, we could spend forever and a day doing that. Uh, so what we've done very recently is piloted uh, a schools programme that fits into the uh, Curriculum for Excellence uh, from the Scottish Government and that's been piloted We've called it Clean Energy from the Seas. That's been piloted in uh, four secondary schools, uh, Orkney, uh, Kirkwall, one in uh, Caithness, uh, and another in uh, West Lothian. And that's been very well received by the pupils. We are now in discussions with the industry and other bodies as to how this could now be rolled out on a more uh, nationwide basis or how that can be more broadly received. So we're very keen uh, and see that as very central to us in Scotland and in the UK, deriving the best benefit as we, that we can from these emerging industries. Um, you know, it's, it's, there's no point in us doing all this work and getting this uh, there for commercial gain. We want to try and maximise that as, we, as much as we can. So we're very keen to have as much homegrown talent coming into these industries as we possibly can. Scottish Renewables published earlier on this year, um, you know, there's over 11,000 people already working in these industries in Scotland just now. Uh, it would be good to see that growing year on year. To, to continue on from, from what Ronnie said, the Clean Energies from the Sea um, uh, project was, was something that came out of the back of our project Forest for the Future, which we developed with the Forestry Commission and uh, in, in line with the Curriculum for Excellence. And I think it's about I opportunities that are within the assets that we manage being opened up to, to wider audiences. Um, and I think a lot of what we do in terms of direct investment in, in our assets creates opportunities. So aquaculture has just been highlighted as a, a growth sector heading for £2 billion. But the figure I saw in, in the report that uh, the, the Minister, Mr Wheelhouse, commented on yesterday was 10,000 jobs in rural areas. You know, those are really important jobs in, in remote communities. And in terms of agriculture, the, the, the members of the committee that came to, to go and live it last year saw... Um, I would say a younger profile of farmer than they would elsewhere and that is because there is investment in fixed equipment and they recognize that actually their units are viable and, and progressive so that when those people are taking those choices at 17 18 to wherever they know that they can go home onto their unit and it's it's viable and, and, and they've got a partner that will work with them so i think what we're trying to do is signpost to the opportunities for growth and that's marine tourism as well um, and i think the tourism you know we this summer in particular, Scotland has, has, has basked in, in, in some great uh, results for, for tourism. Um, and it's interesting in terms of young people, um, if you look at the only, I think it's the only local authority area that has a demographic increasing in the sort of 20s of population is the Cairngorms National Park. And that is because tourism and adventure tourism and recreation is a, is a core growth sector for those areas, which is keeping those people. So there's a choice to, to rather than returning when you're 60 to your home area to retire, you can return immediately post-university because there's opportunities. And I think marine leisure tourism, from my point of view in our sector, is a really great opportunity to, to, to do that. And, and that's, again, investments in uh, you know, working with communities on, on new pontoon projects or... Or Gareth was at Loch Maddy recently, um, the opening of a, a new facility there, which has already had a, a significant impact in, in, in the local community. And that will be, bring people back because they've actually got a viable opportunity. So, Gareth, you want to maybe say about Loch Maddy? Well, I, there, there may be subsequent questions about local management agreements, convener, but um, 
I was very privileged to be through at the opening of the Loch Madi Marina um, uh, in North Uist, uh, uh, the, where the Princess Royal came to, to open it. It's been quite extraordinary. I know when we reported to you last year, I think we had one definite um, um, local management agreement in the pipeline. We now have four completed LMAs and 11 uh, further hopefully future LMEs which, in which we are communicating uh, with the local community. The, the outstanding feature about Loch Maddy, and it's been great that that's been the first LMA to be delivered, was that there was real leaders in the community. There's an individual called Gus McCauley who heads up Common Namara, the Society of the Sea, and North Use the States were very, very... Um, strong in, in driving that. Uh, the Crown Estates activity in that were able to fund a feasibility study for this new marina um, and then we invested £414,000 in the construction of the new marina. But the thing that absolutely astounded me when it went up in uh, the beginning of September for the opening was the a colossal um, use of that marina, that their yachts were turning up even before it was completed and at that stage they'd had 300 yachts and some of them coming from as far away as the Baltic. Uh, they'd had the tallest two-masted schooner in the world had been in and they had cruise ships without notice coming in to almost scout the area. On the ground in that small community the economic uh, effect of that has been that the shop, the small village shops uh, in, income per week had risen by £1,000. The local hotels had risen by £3,000 and they've converted three part-time jobs into, uh, into full-time jobs. And Alan mentioned the uh, marine tourism in, industry in Scotland. Um, as you know, we have a Scottish liaison group uh, where we have, a, we have just invited uh, 30 stake stakeholders to our November meeting but because it's, um, as I said before, because it, with all those people, it's very difficult to go into detail. So we now have subsector groups, and we met with Marine Tourism uh, Group just about a fortnight ago. That industry is now worth £300 million per annum to Scotland, a, a figure that's not known, and it's more than golf in Scotland, which uh, absolutely astounded me. And I talked last year about the string of perils, so how Scotland plans its uh, marine routes for these high net worth people to come in and spend money in these coastal communities. Uh, the Crown Estate has helped in this publication in Scotland welcome anchorages where those, all those details are, uh, are laid down in a magazine. The East Coast is still to do, but that's, uh, that's work in progress. So, uh, as Alan said, the, the outcome of this uh, new LMA has been an extremely collaborative uh, process and we're very proud of it. And um, I may say, on the day that Princess Anne came to open it, we had three other communities came to Loch Maddy to ask our officers how to take their potential communities forward. Okay, well, thank very you. much thank for you. that. Um, okay, um, we should uh, move on to another seaborne topic now with Nigel Don. Thank you very much, Kavina, and uh, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, it's good to see you again. Um, aquaculture, fish farming in particular, would be, would be where I want to start. Um, we've heard all the time over the last few years about expansion of that. It makes good sense for all sorts of economic and, and food security reasons. Uh, I noticed it's in your report. Can you just tell us how you see that progressing, please, and perhaps how far you see it going? Um, so the report I alluded to yesterday, the, the press coverage, you know, talks about aquaculture moving to a two billion pound industry by 2020, employing 10,000 jobs, and, and uh, that growth is is very important. But going back to, to to Claudia's point about sustainable growth, is that aquaculture has a, a tension between food production, demand, and a, a sustainable sort of um, environmental impact. So I think there's a huge amount of work going on in, in terms of, of making sure that that industry is robust and, and can um, defend its credentials, and whether that be RAS, you know, being used to, to, to treat fish lice, um, or whether it be other sustainability methods. I think 
I think it's got a real there's a there's a huge demand for it, whether you say for you know quality protein or for a premium product from from Scotland, um, and I think the growth targets are ambitious but achievable. We we met recently with the agriculture subgroup, um, a real buoyancy in, in that industry, um, about the opportunity, but we are competing. You know we're competing with Norway and we're competing with Chile. Uh, and they were very clear that at the moment there are significant investment decisions being taken about where to, you know, where to invest. And Scotland is is on a pitch with with other areas and, and needs to make sure that they're open for business for for aquaculture. So I think there is an opportunity for sustainable growth. I think one of the interesting developments that's been in the aquaculture field for a while is is more offshore aquaculture and how far offshore the technology can take it. Um, the, the convener mentioned extreme weather events uh, in, in the previous session. You know, putting some of the equipment into some of the areas that we're talking about is hugely challenging, um, even with all of our expertise from oil and gas and engineering. So it's about finding the right places to, to grow aquaculture and the right way to do it. I think the community engagement that a lot of the operators are doing now is far greater than it was in the past. Um, and they're holding sort of, sort of community roadshows to say, do you want aquaculture in your area? And if you do, what does it look like? And I think that that's a huge development because then it's it's um, I've been uh, quoted uh, sorry I've had quote, examples quoted in the past that you know aquaculture arrived in the lock in the 70s and, and we didn't want it. Well, I think those days have to be uh, past us now, and, and the, the the planning processes and marine spatial planning, which is winging its way towards us at the moment, um, and community engagement on terrestrial planning has meant that the, the operators have to get that right up front. So I think if we can get the sustainability credentials right and keep them working and keep the, the industry's good work that they're doing on that, get the community piece and the buy-in from their point of view, I think aquaculture still has a lot of growth to do. Um, and you know the value created in that sector, both upstream and downstream, is is phenomenal. So we're we're hopeful for that. That's why we help invest with R and D. Um, a lot of the transfer of planning responsibilities and things like that is is that sort of crunch point uh, at the moment to make sure available sites are optimised and used, but also to make sure that um, Alex Adrian, who who leads our aquaculture team, you know, who lives uh, in Strachar, you know, he's an industry expert because he's been at it for a really long time, and to make sure that the opportunities that present themselves are, are taken, but also that, that it's not just um, so vacant sites is something that's been o often talked about. Actually, is there an opportunity to do different stuff on some of these sites, whether it be trout or halibut, or whether it be shellfish uh, rather than finfish? So there's, there's a lot to do, but a lot of opportunity. We're okay. also working with some of the, um, the big companies about trialling wave technology to power the, the fish farms themselves uh, and so reduce the, the need for diesel generators on the, on the, the platform. So uh, that, that's going forward just now as well. Thank you for that. That's an extraordinary comprehensive answer and was actually going in all the places I was expecting I might have to push you because uh, particularly I think as a committee when we, when we went through the, the aquaculture bill, the one thing that w came across to w was the you, you would avoid the conflict, conflicts the more you go offshore. But equally, of course, you do want to engage with the communities who are going to have to work there, and of course those environmental consequences are, are also very obvious. I, gu I guess the, the follow-up question then is to what extent do you need our support as a parliament or as a government to achieve some of those things that you can talk so eloquently about? I mean, are, do you have all the, all the powers, all the enthusiasm that you need to make that work? I, I would say that successive governments have been very supportive and the Parliament has always been supportive of aquaculture and I think that that support is welcomed by the industry but they know the responsibilities that, that they have to do. I think the community piece and the, and the offshoring is, a, is actually quite a, a different, difficult dynamic because when we speak to local authorities they want to make sure that the economic activity is as close to, to home and, 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 and dry land as, as possible. And in the, in the subgroup recently, um, as part of our greater engagement with the local authorities, we had a, a member from the islands uh, uh, a group involved in that discussion. And straight away, it was great to see industry talking with local authority about actually what each of them's aspirations were. So I think it's also about making sure that the local areas benefit from those, and, and that's quite a challenge. I think... Um, 
in terms of uh, powers and, and that sort of things, aquaculture is a well-supported industry. I think it's there are there are um, interests that seek to, to fight aquaculture in every step it takes, and I think it's always understanding the, the value and. and Again, the case study in the annual report this year looks at aquaculture and gear and how important it is to services, whether it be, you know, ferries or whether it be schools and, and that sort of things. And and I'm really keen, and, and I'm sure I've told the committee before that when a, a young manager was placed on an aquaculture site, the community were delighted and the feedback was exceptionally positive, and their company couldn't understand why it was so positive. It's because he had three kids at core ages that kept the school open. Uh, and I think to, to make sure that we understand the impact of aquaculture and the Marine Scotland report that was produced earlier in this year by Amani Developments, who did our case studies as well, is really first class in identifying those upstream and downstream uh, sort of values. So as long as Parliament and parliamentarians keep that in mind and, and understand the value and the industry keeps delivering as it has done in, in terms of R&D and improvements and sustainability, I think it's in a pretty good place. <coughs> seashore things and, uh, and so on and uh, then offshore before we move on land. Um, I've got a que question because I was at the launch on Saturday evening of uh, the Dornock project at Glenmorangie Distillery which is uh, using anaerobic digestion but also um, the way in which the excess nutrient goes into the sea is being used to uh, spawn uh, mussel larvae and oyster larvae in the Dornock Firth. Um, there's obviously not aquaculture, but it is um, the kind of natural development uh, that you would be involved in. Have you, have you had any sight of this particular project yet? Because clearly it's in waters that you manage. Um, I personally haven't, but I know that the, the team are working on... Um, that is, I mean, shellfish and, 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 and shellfish farming, and, and some people would call it ranching, um, is still aquaculture, it's still a, and it's still a high va very high-value product. I think that downstream flow of nutrients and, and other uses for feed um, of aquaculture products is really important. It's something we've been looking at in the R&D side of things, and it's like macroalgae and seaweed cultivation as well, so uh, cultivation of, of different seaweeds for feeding of anaerobic digestion that creates power and heat, but also creates animal feeds, pharmaceuticals, and uh, then nutrients that can go back into the system. And Alex and the team have been working quite hard on, on a lot of those aspects, um, because there's real opportunity, I think, in aquaculture to, to close some of the gaps that maybe agriculture can't quite close as, as easily. Um, and again, it's, it's about, uh, Mr. Thompson identified that there is a lot of seabed out there, and there's a lot of opportunity for these sort of long-term sustainable business streams to, to go. Seaweed cultivation at the moment is is relatively low um, uh, uh, in terms of intensity. It's, it tends to be collection rather than farming. But I think for the last three years we've been investing in R&D about how that could be scaled up and how that, it could, I mean, it could go all the way to smart grids on islands that have got ADs that help produce power and heat that produce agricultural fertilisers. You know, there's a there's a really virtuous circle that can be developed. Um, but the key for us, and it's back to, to Claudia's point about sustainability, is that you know we're 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 challenged with making sure that works. And the last thing we want to do is have activities going onto the seabed that are not sustainable, or that go and create havoc in in, in communities and things like that. So, I think it's worth promoting and and worth investing and in, in following. Um, it just has to be done correctly. Okay, um, Claudia, I think you had a question about foreshore uh, matters, is that right? Uh, yeah, th thank you very much, convener. Yeah. Um, uh, it would be helpful uh, if you could clarify for us um, how much of the foreshore has been handed over to communities, if you either have any figures now or, or um, that you could get back to us with, um, and if you have any future targets for, for that. Um. Gareth's touched on local management agreements already, and uh, when we spoke last year, there were sort of four in train. Um, we've now got a list of heading towards 16 um, right across um, the areas. Um, my small visual aid here, if nothing else, to highlight that uh, we'll send this to you. Um, we held off the press this morning. They are predominantly in the west, and we would dearly like for some of the communities that are doing some interesting stuff on the east to, to come forward. In terms of um, areas, um, it's not something we have a, a figure on at the moment because 
each of these proposals is looking at uh, different areas. What we are doing is piloting for sure sales um, with the Carloway Estate Trust at the moment, which is working with them, as, as many of the committee will be aware, I'm sure they're going through their, their ballot and, and buyout process. Um, and so when that became clear that they were going to be successful in moving that forward and before they submitted their land fund application we went to see Carloway and said look we have some for sure interest in your area you have some ownership that I think will transfer with your purchase would you like to look at buying and, and taking control of that for sure in that area and they're going through their due diligence process at the moment and we've helped them through that um, and looking to take a, a sort of go no go decision um, because they're, they're approaching this from a very as you'd expect, a very responsible sort of, this is a decision for the community. We've decided to buy the, the land part of our asset and we need to know more about the, the foreshore side. So that's something we're working with High and the Carloway Estate Trust on. And I'm you know, hopeful that that will work well and, and, and progress. And um, then it can be ruled on, on beyond that. So in terms of you know, number of kilometres or, or, or actually, because some of the LMAs are for 10 yards of foreshore, but what they unlock is 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 massive. So I think we could we could give you an update on where we are with all of all of those dealings, um, but it probably wouldn't be an, an area-based um, uh, report. Um, one of the things we did do in, in in response to I think direct feedback from you last year about promotion of LMAs um, was uh, we went to the Community Land Scotland AGM uh, in in June. Um, and we had a workshop with community owners about the opportunities. And that was really engaging those, you know, over 21 different community organisations in the, in, in the room and others uh, listening to, to the opportunities. And it, that's really awoken the sort of interest in, in there. And I suspect because the, the membership and the makeup of, of CLS members, that's why it's in the, the north and west. Um, but we still, you know, we're still trying to, to push LMAs uh, on, the, on the ground elsewhere. And... You know, it was interesting that one or two people who for sure wasn't owned by us were saying that we could really do with some help um, uh, in terms of what's going on in, in our areas. And we've been able to try and, and work with some of them because of seabed interests um, to develop their projects. And they're right down from small scale aquaculture and, and, and mussel farming to large scale projects and, and, and pontoons. So discussion yesterday afternoon regarding a, a large scale project in Harris. Um, which is looking to unlock a, a significant amount of public funding and, and sort of connect the, the Loch Maddy piece to, to what's going on. And as Gareth said, we've got community groups now asking to come and speak to us or us to go and speak to them because they've heard good things about other groups. And, and uh, you know, I'm quite proud that we've got now local ambassadors saying um, this really worked for us. Go and speak to them and, and they'll help, which, which is progress, I think. The second part of the question, which is about any future targets, and also, um, could you explain a little bit more about the nature of the agreements, the degree to which it is about handing over of management of assets to local communities, or is it is it on a commercial loan basis, or could you explain that as well? So the targets and yeah. just what, or, or maybe they vary. You know, the the um, LMAs. I don't know. I think that's absolutely right. They do vary. Because an, an LMA is not designed to be a, a rigid sort of a process. It's, it's almost a light-touch introduction. Um, and that could lead to a full-scale lease um, of foreshore and seabed. It, it could lead to an investment, such as Loch Maddy, or it could lead to nothing, actually, because they've decided that they can do what they need to do without uh, you know, an interest. But, um, so there isn't a sort of um, you know, LMA equals lease investment, etc. Some of them on the list... Uh, include um, funding, so Glendale Trust and Sky. They've got small-scale development at Loch uh, Pultil, and we've put £5,000 towards the investment into a feasibility study there because we think it's a good idea. It's in its early stages, and it's in line with our investment to create value, um, and we're happy to put that money in. Loch Maddy was a, a more developed proposal. The community were, as Gareth alluded to, you know, really firing on all cylinders, had a well-developed proposal, um, and their business plan was really robust, and that allowed us to, to invest, and that, that's a commercial investment. But different to being a bank, I'm a former bank manager, but I'm okay now. Um, <laughs> um, different to that, we, we, you know, we set up the investment in there in return 
with a risk element to us. So it's not, you know, and it based on the profile of what they expected the growth to be. So you know, there's you know three years of bedding in time to allow that to to, to go uh, and get up. And and we've taken you know in terms of skin in the game, we've taken risk in there that it might not all get paid back. And I think that's a greater understanding and reflection of, of what's happening on the ground, particularly in marine leisure tourism. So that's that in terms of LMAs. In terms of targets, you know, I'm, I've said to the committee before through the land reform process that local management of assets is something that we support. Um, and the more of these we can do in, in, in line with what we're able to do, I'm happy with that. So as, as many as possible, and I reiterate my um, request last year to you guys to bring forward ideas in your constituencies or in projects that you see on the ground because Nigel you've piloted you've you know you've got the aquaculture sort of industry um, responsibilities and, and you guys are engaging on the ground so if there are opportunities that we've not heard about we we really would be happy to see them come forward Angus MacDonald yes thanks Camina. Um, just going back to the foreshore um, issue if, if, if we can uh, just a, a brief question with regard to uh, how detailed are your records with regard to uh, foreshore ownership when you mentioned the Callaway State, I know that in the Western Isles there are crofts <coughs> which have rights to, to foreshore, um, but how detailed is, is that information? It's pretty detailed, um, and uh, <coughs> we think it's quite robust. It, it, it's a huge number of dealings and records, and you know, so I think in the six kilometres at Carloway that we were talking about, there's something like 32 agreements um, that the community thought there was probably six, you know, they, and we started talking about outfalls and, and things like that. So our records are, are pretty robust, um, and, and we made the commitment um, following the LRRG report in terms of land registration to, to make sure that um, we are active in recording that publicly where possible and, and making sure that information's there. Um, I'm not going to say it's perfect. But uh, I think it's in, in, in pretty good order. Um, and we are working with registers of Scotland and, and others to make sure that that data set is as robust as it, it can be. Um, in, in your constituency, we had a, a recent request for information that um, a, a, a large um, processing plant couldn't uh, establish exactly where the foreshore started and ended and where the ownerships were. And our records were able to help them on that. So, you know, it, it's pretty robust. In my constituency of Falkirk East. Well, uh, Grangemouth, sorry, yeah, yeah. The area, yeah. So. Okay. Um, since you've robust um, records of these things, did you sell the foreshore in the 18th century to the Duke of Sutherland and others who own vast acreages of the foreshore now? Ten years is my time horizon in the Crown Estate. <laughs> um, I would have to defer to some of my colleagues who've been there slightly longer, but not in that sort of uh, time horizon. So we can ask uh, the, the, the question of, of what the arrangements were in those areas, but I, I wouldn't like to comment at the moment. I can understand why you wouldn't want to comment, but uh, it would be interesting to see whether, in fact, they were given away or whatever compared to your current behaviour, which is to sell parts of the foreshore. Um, and, uh, you know, that seems to me to be an, a, a, an answer that we should get from you uh, to see if there's been a change of policy over the centuries. Um, there's been a change of Act of Parliament in 1961, and yeah. I think that's probably the, the biggest change. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll just stay offshore for a minute. We explored in some detail the community benefit that can be expected from marine renewables, and uh, we've heard about your investment in Maygen, uh, tidal scheme and indeed the expected go-aheads of the two uh, large offshore wind farms in the Murray Firth. Have you any clearer figures in the total uh, asset value that you mentioned about the expected income per annum uh, from these schemes? Happy to uh, try as best I can convener to, to give an overall picture here. Um, I mentioned last year that the, the offshore wind schemes, um, should they be built, would, for the far offshore schemes, which would be under the round three uh, scenario, at 2020 values, something in the region of £7.6 .6 million per gigawatt. For the closer inshore schemes, um, a typical valuation would be for rental for one gigawatt would be about 4.3 million pounds per gigawatt. 
for remain, uh, marine renewables, by that I mean wave and tidal, uh, we're talking about for something about 10 megawatts, a typical uh, rental would be in the region of £30,000 per annum for 10 megawatts. So that's figures which uh, are being worked on. Uh, do they, um, are they included when you said that the offshore assets, uh, were, you know, with the capital values that you had, is that? No, if I can make a distinction yep. between the capital value and the revenue. So the, these would be the annual rental, if you would like, uh, that we would be expecting to see on deployment uh, and on, on these things um, generating electricity. So these thing, are these items now uh, being included in the Scottish figures? for? Uh, absolutely, and you'll see that we have a, a value yeah. there of £800,000 yeah. um, over the piece. Uh, and that relates to, and there is, I have to be honest and say, there's some rounding up here, so it's not quite fully that sum, but um, that includes some value or some rental income from offshore wind, um, as well as some uh, other revenue uh, in respect of, well, we had £1,000 from Wave and Tidal, um, and um, some revenue in respect of CCS as well. Well, we look forward to updates on that as we go along. It's of considerable interest to uh, us and many communities as to what might become available to them in future because the offshore uh, you know, material uh, that's being produced, not just in the way of jobs, is something which uh, they look to in the way that they would from onshore uh, wind development. Um, I'd like to ask you a question further about land ownership. In the past, you've divested yourself of certain Scottish properties and urban properties uh, in order to invest in supermarket developments or whatever uh, in other places. Are there any parts of your properties likely to be sold in the next year? Um, we work to, uh, you know, our, our investment strategy and look to invest in areas where we can. Um, the, the, the sort of in my area, the areas of sale we're talking about are, are, are transfer, are talking about some foreshore transfers. Um, I've got about 11 acres on the market in small plots. If anyone's in the market for a small housing development in Murray, we've got a number that are not moving as, as fast as we might like, but there are no significant um, sale uh, disposal uh, discussions being undertaken at the moment. Um, and uh, in actual fact, in, in terms of our wider investments, we are still investing uh, uh, in you know some of our urban assets in terms of improvement of those. So um, there are no no major sale um, proposals at the moment. There are some minor transfers we're talking about. So we, we talked in the past about oysters and mussels and, and transfer to the Scottish Government, and I understand that that's uh, now been hopefully approved and, and that will make progress. But uh, uh, no substantial uh, proposals at the moment. Thank you for that, um, Cara Hilton. Um, just in the context of the current debates about more powers for Scotland, I'd be interested to hear more from yourselves about how you think the Crown Estate um, can and needs to change to reflect this, and particularly interested in comments on the Land Reform Reviews Group suggestion that the Crown Estate Commissioner's um, responsibilities under the 1961 Act should be fully devolved to the Scottish Parliament. Uh, if I can just take the, the overall... Um, uh, strategy, if you like. Uh, clearly, it's not for the Crown Estate uh, to make any decisions on this. That's a matter for governments uh, throughout the United Kingdom. Um, what we have set ourselves uh, out to do, and I hope we're doing, is that we're very engaged uh, in discussions with Scottish Government, local authorities, all our stakeholders, uh, communities, and of course now the Smith Commission. And uh, our efforts in that are solely directed to providing um, all these um, bodies with the, uh, clear facts about the Crown Estate's activity in Scotland. And, abs and, and clearly, it is for others uh, to, to take the decisions about what happens with these uh, assets and the ongoing management of it. And with regard to uh, land reform, Alan, I'll yeah, I, I was in, in front of the, the committee on the 4th of June, I think it was, discussing the, the LLRG report. And I think what um, 
we sort of outlined then was that a lot of people are getting a greater understanding of the role that's, that the Crown Estate does have and, and, and does not have. And, and that's the key point, is to make sure people understand what, what we do do. There are areas, and, and the map probably sort of highlights it quite nicely, that there is huge interest in foreshore and, and, and seabed. There are also significant areas where there is zero interest in, in that as well, um, which, is, which is interesting because um, I think we need to make sure that the strategic management of seabed and in particular is, is borne in mind for aquaculture, marine leisure, never mind offshore renewables uh, and the work that Ronnie does. Um, so I think we, we just need to make sure that we provide information into those discussions uh, and we've met with uh, a number of different uh, people participating in, in, in the Smith uh, discussions to make sure that that information is readily available. Okay, further points on that. Um, another point to, about your estate, which uh, Graham Day wants to ask. Uh, thank you, Kamira. A fairly topical subject. I just wanted to, to, to investigate with you. Does the Crown Estate own any land or seabed in Scotland in areas which could become the subject of shale gas extraction? And if so, what position do you take on fracking? In terms of um, do we own seabed in areas, I, I'm sure we will because there are some pretty significant uh, lines being drawn on, on maps, not by us, I hasten to add. Um, and uh, so, uh, so I'm sure we will have interests uh, uh, in there. Um, Ronnie, I think you probably... So far as offshore is concerned, um, the extraction of oil and gas would be a matter for deck offshore. But I'm, I'm thinking more that if there's something on a, on a coastline where they go down and out through the seabed, that would that not impact upon yourselves? Uh, it would still be a matter for deck. Okay. And on land? The, the, the regulators, which you know, would uh, would not be us. No, um, but, but you, you don't have a view on the wisdom of uh, this uh, approach. Um, yes, um, in terms of. Uh, you know, due process and following planning and, and, and um, community and, and, and consultation and engagement. Um, I think there's been a significant amount of discussion about fracking in, in the Parliament and I think there's a cross-party group or a, a meeting last year that I attended that there were some fairly uh, robust exchanges of views um, and uh, I think we would, we would follow, you know, uh, government guidelines and, and policies to where that, uh, where that opportunity lies. That would be Scottish Government yeah. policy, right. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, I think we've had a good range of discussions. I think you might agree with us that this is a valuable meeting to have and that uh, we get updates and there are many other things which we obviously can ask as the year goes by if we require to in between. But uh, we hope to continue this process in future. So thank you very much, panel, for being here. And... Uh, uh, we now, as agreed earlier, will be moving into private in a minute. I will just finish the open part of the meeting by saying this is the last meeting before the October recess. At the next meeting on Wednesday, the 29th of October, the committee will take evidence on Wildlife Crime 2013 Annual Report from Senior Police Scotland representatives and the Lord Advocate. And at that point, I close the public aspect of this meeting and ask the people in the gallery to move out.